So now I invite uh, Dr. Francisco to uh, go with the first talk regarding canadicular obstruction, the overcoming challenges. Dr. Francisco. Good morning to all of you and thank you very much. It's a great pleasure and a great honor to be here at this conference in Kolkata. So my first talk today is about canalicular obstructions, overcoming challenges. This is my only financial disclosure. And whenever we talk, uh, uh, we are thinking about people with canalicular obstructions. Actually, we are talking about people with a, a symptom, which is a watery eye and not really a disease. And also you can decide uh, by examining the patients how, how watery is the eye of the patient, as you can see here. There is a big question about these patients. Is always necessary to perform bypass surgery in case of canalicular obstructions? Well, this is a question we have tried to answer to in the recent past. Uh, first by uh, examining all our past cases about it and then reviewing the literature about this difficult topic. And what we found out is uh, it can be summarized in three main sentences. So accurate identification of the site of the obstruction is very important. Then as anywhere and everywhere in medicine, patient history, and this is because less invasive techniques, which are very popular now, are to be reserved to patients with no associated nasolacrimal duct obstruction. So, first topic, clearly identify where the canalicular obstruction is. So we have to differentiate among proximal obstructions up to four millimeters of patency from the punctum, mid-canalicular obstructions, four to eight millimeters, distal canalicular obstructions, at least eight millimeters of patency from the lower punctum, and common canalicular obstructions. So this means there is an obstruction at the level of the common canaliculus, but it's, it is very important to differentiate between proximal common canalicular obstructions, so at the lateral part of the common canaliculus or just a membrane, which is a medial common canalicular obstructions. So what does the literature say about what we can do? This is when we want to perform real surgery for canalicular obstructions. So retrograde DCRs, I'll explain a little bit better during my lecture, is very effective for proximal canalicular obstructions. For mid-canalicular obstruction, this is possible, but most of these patients will need a lesser Jones tube. Distal canalicular obstructions, well, we can start proposing a lesser Jones tubes. And for common canalicular obstructions, we have to differentiate, as I mentioned, because a CDCR, which is canalicular dacryo sister rhinostomy, is specific for lateral common canalicular obstruction, as opposed to DCR and membranectomy for a distal canalicular block. So we have to keep in mind all these options. And we have all the other options for less invasive surgery, but when are we performing or proposing this kind of operations? Basically when we are absolutely sure that after the canalicular obstructions there is not a nasolacrimal duct obstruction which is associated. So these are the patients who had uh, manipulation of the canaliculi, canaliculi or that have chemo or radiotherapy before or had lots of eye drops with preservatives. So we have to be sure about it. I'll try to explain a little bit more surgery. What is a DCR plus retrograde intubation? I perform it from external. If you're very good, you can do it endonasal as well. You start performing a, a DCR, then you open the, the sac, you identify the opening of the common canaliculus inside the sac, and you proceed by intubating in a retrograde fashion. This is very, very effective for proximal canalicular obstructions when you have 
a normal inferior punctum. If you have to create a, a false passage through the inferior canaliculus and you, and you don't have an uh, identifiable lower punctum, then it's going to fail. And a lesser Jones tube at the second stage is what you will have to do. And as I mentioned before, you can try this for both mid and distal canalicular obstruction, but both in my experience and according to literature, this is rarely effective in about 30 to 40% of patients. So you have to warn the patient and uh, you need proper counseling of the patients to let them know that a lesser Jones tube will be likely at the second stage. CDCR, that was described by Hurwitz in the 80s, is still effective, it's not a very easy procedure. You have to identify the end of both canaliculi and then you have to fashion an anastomosis between the end of the canaliculi and the very big uh, nasal anterior flap. Still effective in about uh, 70 to 75 percent of patients. Of course, you have to be very careful because if there is a distal medial uh, canalicular block that is just a membrane at the end of the common canaliculus, what you need is just a DCR membranectomy and intubation. And this is very effective, about more than 90 percent of patients. So when you propose less invasive procedure. As I mentioned, when you're reasonably sure there is nothing associated distally. And then you, when you have mid-canalicular obstruction, what I find very, very easy to perform, this is an office-based procedure, is uh, you can do an endoscopy and trephination if you have the endoscopy in the endoscopy set. This is quite expensive, so you don't need it for all cases. You can just perform a membranectomy and place the self-retaining intubation set. When you have a, that's very easy, as I mentioned, and you have to have the lower punctum intact. So you don't have to perform a, a three sleep procedure before. When you have a distal canalicular obstruction, what I find very effective is this set, which is a preloaded self-retaining monocanalicular intubation set because you can trefine and place the uh, silicon stent automatically in just one go. Uh, the only thing you have to warn the patient about is that you need uh, to keep the stent for eight weeks and it is a very compact stent, so the patients will keep watering for about eight weeks until you remove the stent. And again, you need the integrity of the lower punctum. So no attempt to do a three snip before that. So when bypass surgery, this is the big question. In just these cases, when there is agenesis or complete canalicular obstructions, when you have a previous failed procedure, when you have inferior distal canalicular block, because if it's a long block from the distal part, and the whole of the common canaliculus, no other procedures will be effective or in some functional cases. You have uh, several types of positioning of lesser Jones tube. Some people prefer an open procedure with an open DCR. This is what I did in the past. Or some people just place it as a closed procedure with endoscopic assistance. Uh, what I think is that when you do it as an open procedure, then you let uh, the tube dance a little bit. So it's very, very mobile. As opposed to when you place it as a complete closed procedure with just a trephination, because you have to put it very angled. So this is obliged, and then you can have to put a very long tube which is angled. So what I do now is to try to perform another procedure first, so standard lacrimal surgery, and try to counsel the patient in, in such a way that they accept uh, a lesser Jones tube as a second procedure. This is why if you have a well-healed DCR before, you have a softish bed, and you can place very correctly, if I can say that, the lesser Jones tube. So what we do, we do now, uh, we have this device in Europe because we don't have any more the standard lesser Jones tube, which I used when I was trained in the UK many years ago. You have this uh, 
um, intubation set, which is very convenient because you have this uh, dilator through the K-wire, you place the K-wire, you identify your opening in the nose, you dilate it. Then there is a sizer with the sizer, you decide the length and the width of the tube, which with this scale, that's very easy to do. Then we put this stop loss Jones tube with a flange, so the flange avoid the tube to be, uh, to come out because it is very stable. What you have to worry about the flange, which is very important that you place the flange about three millimeters distant from the lateral wall of the nose, because if it's very close to the lateral wall of the nose and you have an inflamed nasal mucosa during the flu or just after surgery, then it will push the flange inside. This is why to start with, with the stop loss joints, there was a high tendency of migration of the tube as opposed to uh, extrusion of the tubes. And then you, uh, I place it, I suture it at the medial canthus, uh, at the medial canthus, uh, uh, and you, you leave it in place for about three weeks. So the success is the left surgeon's tube well positioned, stable, and not visible. Is this ac an accepted procedure? If you operate, you will have any kind of adverse effects, so I see them all, but you have to warn the patients about air reflux. When they blow your nose, they will feel air inside their eyes and they, they have to know it before. And also what is quite strange that if the patients get sinusitis after or just the flu, they will experience a sticky eye from mucus reflux from the nose. So you have to tell the patients that had a watery eye, they might get sticky after this procedure sometimes. So why not? In all these categories of patients, it's a good procedure, but you have to select very carefully the patient. This is what I tell to my patients. So in the end, to conclude patient history and accurate diagnosis of the site of obstructions are very important to make your correct choice. Less invasive techniques to be reserved to patients with no associated nasolacrimal duct obstructions. Bypass surgery is okay, but select the patients carefully. Any other option, no treatment in these cases when you, it's better to have a little bit of watery eye. And also, more recently, you can inject with Botox the lacrimal gland. This is quite effective, but you have to warn the patients about possible side effects, which are ptosis and strabismus, double vision. So when you have these kind of obstructions, don't panic, just think twice, there is always a solution. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Dr. Francisco, that, for that wonderful, elaborate discussion on uh, canalicular obstructions, which is a challenge for all of us in our day-to-day -day practice. I think we will have the discussion towards the end of the uh, session. So next, uh, it's my great pleasure to invite uh, Dr. Soumya Narayanan from Kerala uh, to speak about uh, congenital nasal lacrimal duct obstruction. Over to Dr. Soumya. Good morning all. Thank you Dr. Fairoz for this opportunity. Today I'm going to talk about congenital nasolacrimal duct obstruction. So I'll be go going through a few case scenarios. This is a five month old boy, came with watering and discharge since first few weeks of birth. On examination there was purulent regurgitation on pressure over the lacrimal sac area and there was retaining of the fluorescent dye more than five minutes after inspiration. So this is a case of congenital nasolacrimal duct obstruction which present in the first few weeks of life, and the prevalence is noted to be 6 to 20 percent in newborns. And the most common cause is incomplete canalization of the distal NLD, retaining a membrane at the valve of Hastner. So it's present with the triad of watering, discharge, and matting of lashes, and the signs include increased tear film height, positive fluorescent dye disappearance test, and ROPLAS. So it can be either simple CNLDO when there is a membrane, only membrane at the valve of Hastner, and it can be complex when there is diffuse stenosis or fibrosis and there is bony, bony abnormality. So CNLDO variations classified by Johnson Wobbing. The first one is the NLD entering at the vault of the inferior meatus. Second one is a buried probe. And third one is the impacted anterior end of the inferior turbinate. And NLD uh, ending blindly at the anterior end of the inferior turbinate, maxillary wall, 
and complete absence of NLD. So we should rule out the associations like Down syndrome or craniofacial abnormalities and other differential diagnosis of watering and discharge in a newborn like glaucoma, conjunctivitis, and epiblepharon. So for the management, as there is high rate of spontaneous resolution, 90% of the babies becoming symptoms free by their first birthday. So till uh, nine months to one year, we can follow a conservative treatment, including simple observation, massaging of the lacrimal sac, and topical antibiotics whenever there is superadded infection. So for the patient, we can uh, follow the management. And Grigler's massage, the finger is invertly pressed against the lacrimal sac to elevate the hydrostatic pressure inside the sac and the NLD. We should demonstrate it to the parent and ask them to do it four times per day, each time 10 to 15 strokes. So this is a 15 month old baby. You can see the fluorescent dye dispense as positive and increased tear meniscus. This is a failed case of conservative treatment of CNLDO. So this baby is an ideal candidate for lacrimal probing without, without endoscopic guidance. So uh, under general anesthesia, uh, the functum is dilated, syringing is done, you can see the regurgitation there. So adequately sized probe is taken, first vertically, then horizontally, and again vertically. Now the probe is in the NLD, and you can see the passing of the obstruction. And once we get the opening, we can dilate the opening. And this is a repeat of the syringing test, and you can see the fluorescent in the nose. And we also, we have to check for the patency of the other eye also. And this same procedure can be done under endoscopic guidance. You can see a membrane at the valve of Hasner, and the probe is coming out successfully. And syringing is also patent in that case. So there is a debate going between early probing and late probing. Early probing is really indicated in case of sac dilatation, recurrent acute dacrocystitis, and when there is a need for intraocular surgery like congenital glaucoma or cataract. It's done usually in uh, six to 10 months of age. Late probing will give it more time for spontaneous resolution and usually done after nine to 12 months of age and under general anesthesia. And if the first probing fails, we have to roll out complicated CNLDO uh, using uh, um, nasal endoscopy and each kind of NLDO has to be managed separately. And we have to repeat the probing after three to six months of the first probing uh, we can also try lacrimal intubation with silicon tube, balloon dacryoplasty, and if everything fails, dacryocyst or rhinostomy. And in these cases, the age and the type of CNLDO will give the prognostic factor. So lacrimal intubation, either with bicanalicular or monocanalicular intubation, and is avoid annular obstruction at the and contraction inside the NLD during the wound healing. The success is found to be 86 to 89 percentage in different papers. Balloon dacryoplasty is also an uh, alternate option, if main, mainly in failed probing or silicon intubation, and the success is found to be 57 to 68 percentage. Here we will do a pr probing initially, and again we will dilate the NLD using the balloon, uh, dac uh, balloon catheter. So this is a uh, third case where a four-year-old baby presented with ROPLAS positive. There was no uh, pr prior treatment, so we will uh, went ahead with a trial of probing and intubation, and if also, we can also try tracheohistoplasty as the patient is little old. And if everything fails, last, last resort is DCR, endoscopic or external. This is a 20-year-old baby with well-defined cystic swelling in the medial candle area. This is, this is a case of seal, where there is a cystic bluish swelling of the lacrimal sac and accumulation of fluid because of the ball wall mechanism. There is block in the NLD and also a functional block in the uh, common canalicular area, producing a cystic swelling of the lacrimal sac and also a intranasal cyst. The cyst can be, intranasal cyst can be either small or large. It, it, if it is large, it will produce breathing difficulties. So we have to rule out intranasal cyst in all cases of dacrocystocele. So we can uh, give massage and antibiotics as a treatment. Most of the patient will resolve with that. Our patient resolve with that conservative treatment. If it's failing, we can go for probing and endoscopic and intranasal cyst marsupialization. So to summarize, uh, up to one year, we can uh, continue a conservative treatment. And the type and uh, later, if it, if it fails, we can go for, uh, depending on the type and 
age of the patient, we can go, go probing, silicon intubation, dacryl cystoplasty, and nasal endoscopy has a very uh, a, a much important role to finding out the actual cause for the patient and also in the management. And if everything fails, the last resort is DCR. Thank you. Uh, the next speaker is Endos uh, Adisha Bharap, Endoscopic Dactyl Rhinostomy. A very good morning to all. So today we'll be looking at uh, endoscopic dacryl sister rhinostomy um, as a form of a video skill transfer. So I have no financial disclosures. Uh, before uh, diving into the basic points and other things, I would like to take you through a, a video of the procedure to help you understand better. So uh, this is the uh, left nasal cavity and that's the left uh, lateral nasal wall. So a U-shaped incision is usually done anterior to the axilla, 10 millimeters anterior and superior. Um, as soon as that is done, uh, the periosteum elevator is used to elevate this mucosal flap. Once uh, the bone underneath is revealed, this is basically the last step that we do in external DCR, raising the nasal flap that we are doing first in the endoscopic DCR. The bony junction is usually as a sharp right angle between the maxillary and the lacrimal bone and uh, putting your punch uh, easily can perforate the lacrimal bone and we can start the punching using rongeurs. So the initial part of the punching is done using rongeurs quite easily. We can see the sac that is uh, underneath it. Uh, to confirm the presence of the sac, a simple uh, application of pressure just like we do for Roplas is done and uh, the indentation over the sac is easily noticed. Once we punch all the bone that we can access with the rongeurs, the flatter and the more uh, tougher part of the bone is dealt with a power drill. Now over here in the particular video, um, a metronic drill is being used where a suction and irrigation along with the power drill is together with it. But of course, uh, this is not available in all places and this is very expensive. So even a simple mechanical drill along with a manual suction and irrigation can easily be used. The purpose of this is basically to clear the superior most bone that is sitting in front of the common canalicular opening. So that the common canaliculus is free at least around five millimeters. So this is just smoothing of the bone around it. So we can see that there's a good clearance all around the common canalicular opening. That was the probe that was being inserted. The lacrimal bone that we initially perforated, sometimes many pieces of this are still sitting over there. So we need to make sure that all of that is removed prior to the opening of the sac. So the sac is inside using a crescent knife. Now uh, this is a unique step that I've seen um, Dr. Javed Ali use. Uh, he was my trainer during fellowship. Uh, the ENT surgeons usually use a sickle knife, but uh, a crescent blade is easily available in most of the ophthalmologist setup, so I don't think that should be a problem to get. So once the flaps are created, they are reflected like an open book. Mitomycin C is applied to the bony ostium, and then bicanalicular intubation is done. Uh, these two steps are not compulsory. They were uh, performed as a part of routine procedure during our fellowship. The nasal mucosal flap that we first raised is then trimmed in such a manner as to oppose the posterior sac flap as well as cover the superior bony ostium as much as possible. This is a ball probe that is helping to turn the nasal flap and oppose it towards the sac flap. Glue is then applied to keep these uh, surfaces in apposition. Again, this is not a compulsory step. The blood, the thrombin fibrin uh, also works equally well. Intubation is then tied and then suctioning of the nasal cavity is performed. Suction 
tip has to be away from the site of the surgery during this final suctioning. And then a fresh nasal pack is placed, ensuring that it does not entangle within the intubation. So uh, now that we've seen the procedure, just looking at uh, a few rules to master endoscopic DCR. So knowing the anatomy, of course, is of prime importance, but this is something that we've always seen throughout our MBBS textbooks. But the in vivo picture looks something like this, very different from what the textbook showed. So this is the middle turbinate, and this is the axilla, and uh, we have just seen that where we need to incise. And the nasal anatomical variations are very, very frequent. So one must be aware of them. This is actually an ethmoidal bulla that is looking like the middle turbinate. Once we retract it, then only the middle turbinate can be seen. In this particular case, the middle turbinate itself, the anterior end is very much enlarged. That is known as concha bullosa. So the sac is very much posteriorly placed. In order to have a good access and opening of the sac into the nasal cavity, we would have to do a middle turbinoplasty in this case. So keeping these things into consideration. Now knowing uh, the equipment, so this is a typical console unit that we see on the right. The, on the top is the display, then we have the camera head and the light source. The light source varies from xenon, halogen to even LED nowadays. LED is basically the white light that we uh, usually see in the scopes nowadays. And on the uh, left is the Hopkins telescopes. So four millimeter ones are used for operating usually and 2.7 for the clinic. Uh, one can start out as any uncomplicated pandos and roomy nasal cavities that are basically not have been operated before. Of course, uh, one needs to be very comfortable with an external DCR prior to uh, moving on to an endoscopic uh, DCR. As one gains more experience, uh, acute setting cases, acute lacrimal abscesses, repeat lacrimal surgery, ostium procedures like balloon dacryoplasty, narrow nasal cavities like in this particular case, or post ENT surgery, this case underwent FES, and adjunctive nasal procedures like I discussed regarding the middle turbinoplasty can be attempted. Limitations also must be um, a part of your understanding before you move on to the surgery. So post-trauma, lacrimal sac diverticular, where you might want to externally expose uh, multiple areas, lacrimal rhinosporidiosis, need for any additional external surgery. And last but not the least, definitely when you're out of comfort zone, avoid going ahead with the surgery. Apart from the systemic clearance, a good hypotensive anesthesia, and a nasal decongestion prior to starting the procedure. These are merosyl sponges that are dipped in 1 is to 10,000 adrenaline, and then a mucosal infiltration is done with 1 is to 80,000 adrenaline, following which the nasal packing is done, and then we start the procedure in the next 10 to 15 minutes. This gives a good uh, control of bleeding during the surgery, good hemostasis. So we had a look at most of these equipments. So the micro debrider is something we didn't look at. It's basically a very fine, uh, it does the job of a very fine scissor. It trims the mucosa uh, as required. And um, it gives a very smooth cutting edge, but it is extremely sharp and narrow nasal cavities is something to be borne in mind. The other things we've already seen, the diamond burr, mitomycin C, and intubations. So apart from um, all the routine instructions for uh, uh, external DCR, the advantages of uh, endoscopic go uh, about no restriction of head bath and no external wound care. So it's a faster rehabilitation. So uh, to conclude, how, what, and where do you start from? So uh, examining, uh, starting with the endoscope and getting familiar with the endoscope to identify the normal anatomy, recognizing the variations. And the best way to start this is by examining DCRs of external, uh, endos ostiums of external DCRs that we have previously operated in the clinic. Starting slow, I'm sure everybody over here uses a lot of equipment, including FACO, so developing a hand-eye coordination won't be an issue. So slow instrument handling and step-by-step -step, uh, processing in successive cases. And last but not the least, having an open mind about keeping a backup, either uh, help from an experienced surgeon, it may be any oculoplasty surgeon or even an ENT surgeon who is experienced with this surgery, and Converting to an external DCR if uh, we're stuck in the middle of the surgery should always be kept in mind. 
I would like to acknowledge my mentor, without whom any of my endoscopic presentations are incomplete, Dr. Chaved Ali. Thank you so much for your patient listening. Excellent talk. Uh, our next speaker is Marian Pauli. His uh, title is Failed This Year. What do you do? Failed This Year is really a challenge, challenging case and problem. Uh, thank you, AOS and Dr. Ferus for giving me this opportunity. So, failed DCR is a big challenge in our lacrimal clinic. Uh, so, in this talk, basically, I deal with three things. What are the causes, and how will you evaluate, and how will you manage? So, failed DCR can come, can come to you even in the first week of your surgery, as early as, and the late failure can come even after 12 months. On an average, the retractor says around four months is the failure time. And it can be either anatomical failure or a functional failure. So first we will analyze what are the causes. The most common is like fibrous tissue growth. Second, inappropriate ostium. That inappropriate in terms of size as well as in position. So inadequate osteotomy means, so from Dr. Richa we have learned, we, have, we saw what's the si what should be the size of the uh, bone removal. So inadequate osteotomy means the bond removal that failed to expose the lacrimal sac completely, including the fundus and the proximal isolacrimal duct. Then the position of the uh, ostium, if, the, if you are not removing the inferior sac, it can cause, uh, uh, later on it can lead to some syndrome. Second, third one is the associated common canalicular block. Then inadequate sac opening. That means like you have not marsupialized the sac properly or the sac opening uh, incomplete. We come of uh, some of the nasal causes that is uh, missing a nasal polyp and polyp obstructing the ostium. Then second is intervening ethmoids. In my lacrimal practice, this I co come across very often. That is, even in the literature says, in around 46 percent of cases, the ethmoid is history for any systemic inflammatory diseases. Then rule out functional NLDO. That means the ostium is uh, patency is there, but the patient is having uh, watering due to the pump failure uh, that happens in occult uh, facial nerve palsy or uh, other causes. Then now, uh, after ruling out the surface lead causes, look for the lacrimal patency, which we have learned from uh, Dr. Saumia. Uh, do a dye disappearance test and see whether the dye is draining. We can use it with the help of endoscope also, you can see. Then do a lacrimal syringing, lacrimal irrigation to see whether the there is a pus coming or it is immediate regurgitation, delayed regurgitation, associated canalicular blocks, etc. Uh, do a probing to confirm whether it is at what level is the obstruction. Uh, very, very important is the nasal endoscopy. Why it has failed, whether any nasal causes, uh, any granulation tissue obstructing the ostium, etc. Then in some cases you might require uh, imaging, CT scan of the orbit with PNS, especially if you're suspecting some uh, tumors or inflammatory causes, or even to assess the relationship of the ostium, or it assess the size of the ostium. Then dactyl cystography and lacrimal scintillography can be done, but lots of financial implications are also there. So DCG will delineate the lacrimal drainage tract, and you know the exact site and nature of the obstruction. So these are some of the high risk factors. I mean. Especially when you operate on a small sac, I mean, small sac opening is high risk for failure. Then a prolonged surgery induces more, more of inflammation, can lead to fibrosis. Then when you're operating in an active phase, active inflammation also can cause uh, it's a high risk for failure. Then inadequate flaps. And, and the important thing is intraoperative orbital fat prolapse. If you see a fat coming out to the ostium, uh, just cauterize it or excise it. And uh, finally, thermal damage if you're using too much of cautery to the ostium. Uh, so how will you manage? Uh, once you are confirmed it's a failed DCR and no associated canalicular or fungal or other functional causes, you have to revise the DCR. Either it can be done um, either externally or endoscopic approach. So few tips when you revise external DCR, you can use the same skin incision. And uh, sometimes, like majority of the surgeons will not cut the anterior limb of male candle tendon. So most of the time that area will be fully scarred and to get good exposure, you can cut the anterior limb of male candle tendon. 
then identify the original edges of the original uh, edges of the original rhinostomy then do um, <coughs> free the periosteum all around for 4 mm osteotomy uh, done to expose the virgin nasal mucosa then identify the lacrimal sac and make the flap uh, here the whole area will be fibrous so you put a uh, Bowman's probe in the upper canaliculus and lower canaliculus and uh, incision should be very careful you should not injure the canaliculus then uh, after making the flap keep the flap under tension and suture otherwise uh, again it can uh, cause closure then there are so many adjunctive measures you can use mitomycin C either you can inject locally or you can topical application uh, for three minutes some people use it for five minutes that is surgeon preference the advantage is large ostium and higher wax access rate silicone intubation is little controversy because some of the others say it induces granulation tissue formation can induce infection in my experience uh, if you remove it like I remove it three to four weeks time usually will not cause any problems and it is very very beneficial if there is an associated common canalicular block then trephination if there's a distal canalicular block you say you can use a trephine to uh, remove the fibrous tissue then uh, balloon dacryoplasty so here comes uh, the internal ostium stenosis so what do you mean by internal ostium stenosis uh, there is a minimal dye passage through ostium on irrigation uh, observed with endoscope and uh, resistance on irrigation in that case you can use lacrical catheter to enlarge so to conclude uh, failed DCR is always a big challenge a careful evaluation um, can give you very good results and the patients will be very thankful if you do a great job. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, very good speaking. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Mohammed Saeed Alam. Uh, his topic is medial canthal swelling. Can we move? Good morning, uh, everyone. So I'll be talking upon uh, medial cancel swelling. So first of all, I'll just show you uh, two cases. It's not moving. Yeah. So these two cases, when you cursory look at them, so more or less they look similar. So both of them have a mass in the medial cancel area. So, but when we clinically examine, you see the case here has a mass in the medial canthal area, but it's a firm mass and the skin is quite puckered to it. <coughs> it's going above the medial canthal tendon. When you see this case, so this patient has a fluctuant mass in the sac area, quite inflamed. So, this is a common lacrimal sac swelling, a patient of acute, uh, a patient of uh, nasolacrimal duct obstruction was presented with uh, lacrimal sac abscess in the emergency. But this case, it's a mass in the medial canthal area. It can be anything. It can be arising from the, the lacrimal sac, or it can be a mass arising from the medial canthal tendon, in the medial canthal skin. So now, when, whenever you see such cases, so now you have to decide like what to do. Clinically, you have to judge whether at, this mass is at all arising from the lacrimal sac or not, because that is the most common site from where a mass in the medial canthal area can arise. And then you have to think whether I need to do imaging in this case or not, whether I, to do, uh, I need to start the patient on, on antibiotics, whether the patient will need a biopsy in the future. So all these cases, I will, sh I will show you uh, a few cases where like, you will get you know, answer to all these questions. So this is a case, 51-year-old female who has presented with a cystic swelling in the medial canthal area has been there for around two months. And patient gives history of recurrent self-resolving episodes. So when a patient, such a patient gives such a history, so we think it's a, it's a lacrimal, uh, it's a nasolacrimal duct obstruction with a, with, a, with a mucosal in that area. And patient has also undergone incision and drainage elsewhere. So then patient presents after a few weeks with this kind of a picture. And of course, when we do a row plus, it's negative, syringing is patent, so it's a not, not a case of nasolacrimal duct obstruction. So we also did the same thing, we did an incision and drainage for the patient. This is a, the imaging of the patient where you see a, a hypertense cystic mass just, you know, adjacent to the nasolacrimal duct. So patient, as I told, was un underwent, patient underwent incision and drainage, but then again presented with a residual mass in the same area and the imaging sh uh, showed a residual swelling in the same area. 
So now we had to do something else. So we went ahead, we opened the, uh, the sac area, and what did we find? So we found a, a cystic mass in the area of the, of the lacrimal sac. So of course it had a super uh, added infection, but the histopathology showed that it's an in, it, it was an inclusion cyst right along the area of the nasolacrimal duct. So it was not a nasolacrimal duct obstruction, as we had seen, seen in the clinical examination also that the rho plus was negative and syringing was patent. So this is post excision biopsy, patient now doesn't have any history of swelling and of course no, no complaints of watering. Another case, a young female history of, again history of recurrent swelling below the medial canthus for the past one year. Patient has been diagnosed with lipoma, elsewhere has been advised surgery and uh, swelling is progressive, non-tender, rho plus was positive in this case but syringing was partially patent with fluid accumulating in the sac area, which is a typical thing that we get in, a, in any case of atonic sac. So we thought it's a case of atonic sac. Imaging again showed a large hypertense, hyperintense cystic mass in the area of the nasolacrimal duct. So again, opened it, we went inside, what did we found? We found a large intraluminal cyst, a cyst, whether it was within the lacrimal sac or adjacent to the lacrimal sac, it was difficult to differentiate. This was the blood which, could, which was aspirated from the, from the cyst and histopathology showed, just showed that, like it, it, was a, it was a cyst arising from the lacrimal sac area and intubation was done, patient also underwent a DCR and the post-op area was doing well, watering had dissolved. Another case, young female again with a swelling in the medial canthus area, here you can see for the past five months. This is the, 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 the swelling in the medial canthus region. Rho plus negative syringing patent. So of course, again, it's a not a case of nasolacrimal duct obstruction. Patient was advised conservative management, swelling persisted for three months then and, and MRI was advised. Again, MRI shows a large or hyperintense mass adjacent to the nasolacrimal duct. So we opened it up and what did we find? A large mass in the area of the nasolacrimal duct, just adjacent to the, and the mass was like, it was so much adherent to the surrounding structures, it was difficult to, you know, to delineate the anatomical structures, the sac, the nasolacrimal duct. So some portion of lacrimal sac also got, got sacrificed in the process of re removing it. So we removed it, managed to remove it completely and put, put a mini monocast stent. Histopathology showed granulomatous inflammation. It was a granuloma arising from the area of the nasolacrimal duct. So now granuloma can be anything, we screened the patient for tuberculosis, we, we ruled out sarcoid, everything was negative. And uh, patient, this patient uh, had, after removing of, of the mini monoca, had persistent watering and developed a canalicular fibrosis. Now this is another uh, uh, case of a young male swelling in the medial canthus area for the past one and, a, one and a half year. You see, a typical swelling which resembles a kind of a mucosal. So the mass has been gradually increasing in size. Again, rho plus is negative and syringing is patent. So it's a not a case of nasolacrimal duct obstruction. So again, you need to do an imaging. Imaging shows an hyperintense cystic mass below the area of the opening of the nasolacrimal duct. So we open it and this is the intraoperative picture. Typically, as all you can see, it's a case, it's, it's an epidermoid cyst. That's how an epidermoid cyst looks like. So histopathology confirmed that it's an NEP, epidermoid cyst. And of course, this patient didn't have any watering in the follow-up period. Another case, 35-year-old female, complaints of mass below medial cancel area here in the left eye and associated with watering for the, for the past six weeks. Patient gave history of frequent bathing in the op open ponds had been diagnosed as like ramal sac rhinosporidiasis elsewhere. Rho plus was negative, but syringing showed complete regurgitation of fluid from opposite puncta. So we thought like it might be a case of nasolacrimal duct obstruction, but then since the mass was palpable, we did an MRI and this is, sorry, a CT scan and this is what the CT scan showed, an ir irregular ill-defined mass in the, in the sac area. So we plan to open it with an uh, with a intraoperative frozen section. So the moment we, we opened it, we saw a cystic um, swelling in the area and we aspirated the, the, you know, the fluid from the cyst. It was a pus-like thing. And the moment the, the cyst was removed, the syringing was patent uh, on table. So uh, histopathology didn't uh, show anything, but microbiology and further DNA sequencing confirm it to be Pleurostomophora Richardi. So it's a case rare, you know, dematicious fungus, 
we also published it in, in uh, OPRS journal as a case report. Uh, uh, it's a pleural stromophora mass which presented as a case of transient nasolacrimal duct obstruction because of the compression of the nasolacrimal duct. So mass region in the lacrimal sac region can be a diagnostic dilemma and sometimes they can, uh, they should be differentiated from uh, benign lesions like they can present with history of, they present with history of hemolacria if they extend above the medial canthal tendon and if they are adherence to the surrounding structures. So to conclude, it's a diagnostic challenge. Of course, the most common mass in the medial canthal area will be a mucosal resulting from a nasolacrimal duct obstruction, but then again, other causes of lacrimal and perilacrimal masses need to be considered in all the, uh, these cases of medial canthal masses. Imaging plays a vital role and role of basic history and clinical examination cannot be underscored. Thank you. Excellent speech. The, uh, there is a uh, case presentation here. Uh, is the last speaker, Anna Kurian. Good morning. Uh, my name is Dr. Anna Kurian, and first of all, thank you to AIS, Dr. Mariam Poli, and my mentor, Dr. Annie Strazer, for giving me the opportunity to present this case. This is a case of a 59-year-old male who came to our OPD with painless swelling of the right lacrimal sac region of two months duration. He gave a history of dactrosisterhinostomy with sac biopsy, which was done elsewhere, and the biopsy results suggestive of papilloma. On clinical examination, there was a five into four centimeter ovoid, non-tender, firm, immobile mass, uh, which uh, was seen extending above the medial palpable ligament. And the surface of the lesion showed ulceration, probably due to a non-healing uh, incision site. And there were no palpable regional lymph nodes. CT scan showed a homogeneous soft tissue lesion uh, with minimal bony excavation. So with the history of uh, papilloma and the CT finding, we, went, we decided to go ahead with right lacrimal sac mass excisional biopsy. However, during the intraoperative period, we found the tumor to be extending into the nasal cavity via uh, the DZ rostium uh, made by the previous surgery. So the mass, uh, mass was sent for histopathology and the uh, findings were suggestive of well-differentiated squamous cell carcinoma. Uh, the final diagnosis was squamous cell carcinoma of lacrimal sac and the patient was referred to ENT and oncology department and further resection was done by the surgical oncologist. Uh, however, within one month of referral itself, there was again a local recurrence at the site, and the surgical oncologist went ahead with wide excision of the lesion, with excision of one-third of upper and lower eyelids, periorbital fat, medial wall of orbit, medial one-third of floor, and medial maxillectomy was done. And reconstruction was done using paramedian for head flap, tensile rotation flap, cheek uh, rotation advancement flap, and nasal mucosal lining graft. Uh, and the histopathology of the final lesion was well-differentiated squamous cell carcinoma. The resected area margins were free of cancer. And pathological classification, according to AGCC 7th edition lacrimal gland tumor classification, was T4 without any nodal metastasis. The patient receive, is, is on receiving uh, arduine radiotherapy and is being kept under follow-up every three months. Now, the highlights of this case was, one, uh, deep incisional biopsy is preferred in case of a suspicious sac during routine DCR. But one, the main reason is uh, with a superficial uh, biopsy, you may miss the malignant cells and will only get the inflammatory reaction. Second part is that uh, in case of an inverted papilloma, which is benign, but uh, there is a 7 to 16 percent of cases, uh, squamous cell carcinoma can occur either synchronously or metachronously. And the second thing is uh, the lacrimal sac fossa or a DCR ostium should not be created in case of a suspicious sac during your routine DCR because this will aid in the spread of the tumor. First get the biopsy specimen analyzed and then decide on the treatment. Going ahead with the discussion, lacrimal sac tumors are extremely rare but they are potentially life-threatening and around 55 to 100 percent of the tumors are malignant. So their technical workup and management is very important. Uh, signs and symptoms suggestive of a lacrimal sac tumor is uh, a chronic nasal lacrimal duct obstruction, hemolacria, uh, a mass uh, which is non-reducible, non-compressible of a hard mass, and uh, there is sanguineous uh, hemolacria. 
Uh, and late stage, you have signs of orbital invasion, suggestive of non-axial proptosis, skin ulceration, and rarely distant metastasis. Lac uh, as you all know, the lining of lacrimal sac, you have pseudostratified columnar epithelium with interspersed cilia uh, ciliated respiratory epithelium. And the nasolacrimal duct has ciliated uh, respiratory epithelium. So you have a vivid uh, number of tumors which can arise from the lacrimal sac. Uh, the main is epithelial uh, tumors, which account for 60 to 94 percent, of which the most common benign is a papilloma, and the most common malignant is a squamous cell carcinoma. Non-epithelial tumors include lymphoproliferative, melanocytic, and mesenchymal tumors. Uh, one other point is inverted papilloma, like I said, is benign, but it's a locally, locally aggressive tumor with high chance of malignant transformation to squamous cell carcinoma. And also there is a, a chance for squamous cell carcinoma to occur in it synchronously or metachronously. Squamous cell carcinomas are highly malignant. They have a 50% chance of recurrence and 50% of which is, 50% uh, of it is fatal. Risk factor for malignant transformation include H, uh, positivity for H, HPV, high mitotic fever, figures, overexpression of P53, EGFR, or TGF-alpha. Uh, and coming to the management, uh, first is tissue biopsy. And if it's benign and confined to the lacrimal sac, dacrocystectomy is done. If it's malignant, an end block tumor excision with maxillectomy is preferred to increase the survival rate. And depending on the extent, resection of the uh, orbit, uh, orbital walls and or paranasal sin sinuses or lymph nodes, depending on their spread. Uh, Postoperatory radiation is preferred. And chemotherapy in case of, uh, in case of recurrent or in case of lymphoma. Uh, so for the take home message, look out for any unusual findings do, during a DCR and uh, do a, a a sac biopsy, preferably a wide biopsy is required. And uh, the usual unusual findings are one, uh, recurrent DCR, or the patient has, um, sorry, um, hemolacria, non-compressible uh, non lesion, and on table, if you find the lacrimal sac to be hardened, um, yeah, preferable to go with uh, biopsy at least, and stop, stop doing the DCR osteum. Um, I extend my courtesy to Dr. Sajida and Dr. Uh, Anand Ibn Thomas for giving me the help, and that's it. Thank you. Yeah, yeah thank you, uh, Dr. Anna, for the nice case presentation. So we start our uh, discussion to the panelists. Uh, 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 first question to Dr. Francisco, that uh, you were... Uh, uh, inserting a Jones tube because uh, bicanular obstruction is the most devastating condition. It's very difficult to manage. How will you fix this Jones tube? Yes, I, I show it. Uh, when I, work, I put the surplus Jones tube, then I use a fibroproline around the color of the tube and I suture it uh, close to the medial canthus on a bolster, and I keep the bolster three weeks. So I just see, I see the patients, I mean, in five days or six days, then I tell them what to do, not to blow their nose, and then I see them again in three weeks. I used to keep them one week or two weeks, but there is no point, it's not tedious, it's not dangerous to keep this uh, suture for about six weeks. What I don't like is, <laughs> Well, it's not very easy to pass three or four times the proline suture around the tube, and you get used to it. Internally, uh, are you doing any fixation of the tube? Internally? The oh. No, because with the uh, stop uh, loss, I mean, you have the flange. And as I mentioned, I put it usually now as a secondary operation. So I advise the patient. I think it is a quite challenging, not the operation itself, to deal with these patients. They are coming over just for watery eyes. So, I mean, I'm doing less in the last few years. If I compare what I did 10 or 15 years ago, I do fewer le uh, lesser Jones tubes now because I select very carefully the patients. Yeah, this is very difficult to manage. The next speaker is a congenital lacrimal duct obstruction. The speaker is Shomonayan. Uh, are you, did you uh, uh, advise any message to the children? Lacrimal sac message? If 
there is no recurrent acrocystitis or any uh, sac, sac dilatation, I will advise massage till the one year of age. Uh, the Krigler's uh, the massage itself for four times per day, 10 to 15 strokes each time. And I will uh, uh, ask the parent to demonstrate how they are doing and if the correct method of sac massage is very important. Mm -hmm. And till one year, I will follow up that. Only. But when you start probing first? Usually after uh, 12 months of age. At the last, how long means uh, at the, uh, which age uh, is the cutoff of a uh, probing test for the children? You understand my question? Yes, sir. At what age is the cutoff of probing for the children? If the Can you do a four years, five years? Yes, sir. If the pa patient is coming for the first time and there's no history of any treatment before that, till f five years of age also we can try a trial of probing. So we actually, uh, when we when the child presses in four years, we actually post probing syringing plus minus DCR. Like it's an intraoperative decision based on your uh, the findings. Can I just add a comment over here regarding the sac massage? I mean, we all think that it's easy and everyone is doing, but there is sometimes we feel that you know there is a wrong concept among general ophthalmologists, even pediatricians. So I think the name massage should be changed to compression. Right, yeah. So when you say massage to a parent, they nicely give oil massage when they're giving bath to the child, right? So it has to be really, really, you know, uh, told to the parents that it's more of a compression, you know, rather than a massage. I think we should uh, change the sac term of sac massage to sac compression in uh, advising the parents, yeah. And uh, to add to Dr. Fairuz, you can use some ointment so that it will be uh, very uh, smooth for massage is going to be smooth for the kid and the parent also. And then one more thing, like parents will keep on asking, like how many strokes? So as doctor told, like uh, 10 to 15 strokes. So I feel two to three strokes are enough because you just when you give one compression, the sac gets emptied. So after that, like how many compressions you give doesn't matter because there's nothing inside the sac. So because that compression and then the fluid goes out but, and because it's a hydrostatic pressure which op opens up the membrane. So that one compression, if it goes, the fluid goes out nicely, the membrane can rupture. So after that, there's nothing in the sac, so there's no point giving further compression. So I think just three to four compression is enough. And uh, to answer Professor Lil's question, what is the cutoff? So in our practice, there's no cutoff for probing in CNLDO. If a patient has come, a CNLDO has come to you, it's a virgin case, hasn't been operated, 10 years, 12 years, 15 years, give a chance, give a trial of probing. Of course, as Dr. Marian told, plus minus this here. Uh, most of the time, uh, the advice is wrong, I think, because if uh, they are not blocked the common current release, that hydrostatic pressure is never created. If the hydrostatic pressure is created, that is the successful message. That most of the mother, when it comes to me, they are wrongly uh, advised that message. That is the problem. Uh, the next speaker is endoscopic GCR, uh, Richard Tharap. Uh, just uh, to add on to doctor, uh, what Dr. Ferru said, um, I have usually started uh, practicing, demonstrating it on the mother's or the caregiver's uh, sack. And then I always get a response, oh, it is this much pressure. Exactly, exactly. So, yeah. yeah, that's very important. It's a very minor thing, yeah. but I think we should take, give that message to the uh, delegates and audience here. Uh, regarding uh, endoscopic DCR, uh, what is your success rate? It is as good as external, sir. 95 to 99. 95 to 90? 90. 99. Nin 99. Yes, sir. <laughs> Almost 100%. <laughs> uh, DCR is very unpredictable surgery, I, I feel. Uh, the soft tissue surgery is never guaranteed. Any times it can fail, you can explain to the patient may or may not. <laughs> this is my advice. Yes, success is always uh, better. So next is a failed DCR. Who is uh, uh, Marlene Paul? You? Yeah. So, uh, uh, what is your strategy for failed DCR? Uh, failed DCR, like, uh, if, you're, uh, if I'm revising the uh, DCR, what I do is I have already explained, go along the same scar, and uh, intraoperatively, basically, the adjunctive measures. If the fibrosis is too much, I usually inject uh, uh, mitomycin C. And uh, postoperatively, I will add little systemic steroids also. And, uh, uh, Steroid nasal spray I usually give for two to three weeks. 
So most of the time, uh, it should be successful. Second thing, the major challenge is creating the flaps. Sometimes the whole ostium will be fibrosed and you don't have a uh, normal tissue anywhere nearby. So then creating flaps will be a real challenge. In like, too much of fibrosis and I cannot create an ostium. Uh, last, last resort, I have done a mucous membrane graft uh, to replace the lacrimal sac uh, with, a pre, with a written consent. So that, is, that will really work well. That's my experience. Thank you. Uh, I'm, I think you must enjoy the session. The, uh, the time is out. <laughs> Thank you for the participants. Thanks so much. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks to the chair. Thank thanks to the much. moderator, co-chair, and Dr. Francisco. It's an honor and pleasure to have you with us uh, today. Thank you so much. Thank you.